Good afternoon and welcome to our webcast on the changes for accounting requirements. A brief overview of accounting online and the digital tax mailbox. My name is Bernie Del Rio, managing partner of Jay Del Rio, and I'm joined here by, by my good friend Leo Gamis, a supervisor from our tax department. We will be discussing this subject for approximately one hour and we'll have 15 minutes for questions and answers. As you will see on the right-hand side of your screen, there is a tab that will open for you to see ask your questions. We, we suggest that you send them during the course, and they will be addressed in the Q&A session if we have time for everyone. And if any are pending, we will definitely get back to you and answer them. The recording of this webcast, as well as the slides, will be available on our website or upon request by email. Uh, hi, uh, good morning. Good, good morning to everybody. Very thank you for the, for the presentation. Uh, well, on behalf of Team GL The Rio, we would like to give you a warm welcome to this webcast that we have prepared for you guys to let you know the latest and more significant changes uh, related to accounting and digital mail rules. Basically, this slide that we are watching here, uh, it's a chronologically and a background of the, of the most recent changes that occurred in Mexico related to the federal tax code. In 2013, the new Mexican federal tax code was published and it's uh, applicable and uh, becomes mandatory uh, in 2014. Later on, in April 2nd, 2014, it released the regulations of this federal tax code. And later on, the following day, on April 3rd, those rules become uh, goes into effect, becomes mandatory. Basically, these regulations becomes complementary information of the federal code itself, and therefore it becomes mandatory as well. One of the main changes of this regulation relies on the way accounting is done. Uh, we'll see that this new regulation establishes way and obligation related to accounting that must be complied. Uh, the thing here is that in the past tax law, they established the possibility from the taxpayers to be able to make their registration according to the best way that fits their businesses. However, uh, the rules have changed, and now we all must comply with these new regulations. The, the important thing to note here is that all of this goes into effect April 3rd with no transition period. So uh, the government really got us there with absolutely no transition, and with a bunch of new rules, uh, as we'll start seeing. Right, and, and this is no, no big news for us. Uh, recently here in Mexico, we have seen a lot of tax reform that took place since the last couple of months. We have uh, energy reform, we have social security reform, we have income tax reform, and now we're watching some reforms related to accounting. So getting into business uh, regarding the accounting requirements, the slide that we are going to show right now basically shows uh, why you can consider accounting rules according to the federal tax code. The federal tax code itself establishes in Article 28 uh, nine requirements or nine things that will be considered as part of your accounting. Uh, the, the first one is itself the accounting book systems and entries. What are we understanding here? Well, basically uh, everything, all your registrations, your journal entries, and everything that becomes part of the accounting. Also, the work papers, uh, meaning these, uh, all the spreadsheets that you could have on, on the other side where you prepare your taxes, your tax returns. Uh, all the paperwork that you use on preparing your accounting books. An interesting thing here is the related to the account statement. This is uh, something new. Uh, in the past, this was well, this didn't exist, and we will see in a little bit more uh, further slides what comprehends here the uh, word account statement. We'll see that it comprehends bank statements, uh, investments, and some other. Uh, statements that will need to be considered as part of your accounting. Also, we have that your accounting is it's integrated by the inventory control and valuation methods and by your corporate books and records. That by corporate books and records, we have uh, to comprehend here the minutes of the companies, uh, the constitutive minutes for the companies. 
Something very interesting here that also specified this same Article 28 of the Federal Tax Code is the obligation that the accounting, and by accounting we mean all of what we have mentioned so far, needs to be in the tax domicile of the company. This is very important and it's very important to have in mind at all times. Some other things that are to be considered uh, as part of the accounting, we have the special accounts. Uh, later on, maybe we can give a few examples. We have also disk and tapes or any other electronic data storage system. And what are we meaning by here? Uh, I'm pretty sure that you are all aware that you, uh, because of the regulations for the uh, support documentation, the electronic invoices, it is specified that you also have to file your XML files, uh, meaning like the electronic files of your invoices. So the regulations, or it's usually common practice that you have your electronic invoices filed in a special hard drive or special software computer, well, this is the disk and this is the data that they are referring here that becomes also part of your accounting. We have also uh, the tax entry equipment, electronic system, and their respective entries, basically all your computers, your software uh, for the accounting, that will be also comprehended here in the definition of what is being considered accounting. And uh, additionally, all documentation and information related to this compliance, meaning here like the invoices that support the transaction of, of your operations and when they include here all documentation, it, meaning that it's anything that they could have missed. So if, if we bring in here, basically we have to have in mind that whenever the tax authorities are referring to accounting, it will contain all the items described above. And, and Leo, I think a lot of this was done by the authorities to kind of broaden their their grasp of what is accounting because a lot of maybe not so honest taxpayers try to claim that certain things were not accounting in, in tax court cases and, and therefore the government wanted to increase the scope of what was considered legally accounting. The, the special accounts that you're referring to are, for example, the memorandum accounts that the are sometimes registered. They really don't affect your financials, but, but are part of, of the records. Uh, so that, that would be included as well. Right. Right, for sure. Uh, following on this slide, and uh, it comes in hand of the past slide, is that Article 28 of the Federal Tax Code, which we already read, uh, referring to what is comprehended as accounting, also specified that what you will have to have in order to comply with having accounting books, it's, it will be uh, established in the rules, in the federal tax rules. These rules are the ones that we are going to discuss in here. And these rules are the ones that were published in April 2nd and becomes mandatory in April 3rd, the following day. So now that we see article, we, we look around and see this article 33rd of the Federal Tax Code rules, we have that this article is divided in two big sections. Section letter A basically establishes the documents that integrate the accounting books. These documents are going to be uh, described in, in, this, in this slide and in the following ones. And later on, we're going to touch base on the second part of this article 33rd, which basically mentions this letter B, uh, section B, and it's related to the requirement that the accounting book, the accounting journal entries will need to comply. All, all accounting registrations will need to comply. And uh, one of the things uh, that, that can come, uh, and then I'll let you give your comment, Leo. Names on, ch on your chart of accounts will be very important. And, and we, we run into cases where uh, and, and you have to remember that per se allocated expenses that are not directly related to Mexico are non-deductible by statute. And, and you run into uh, companies where on the chart of accounts you have allocated expenses as one of the accounts on your chart of accounts, even if it's not, even if you're not having charges to that account, uh, 
it, it's not a good idea to do something good that looks bad. So uh, if, if it's not the concept that's really being charged to Mexico, then, then that's something to take a look at. Right, definitely, Jeremy. Here it's also worth mentioning that uh, when the, these rules refer to voucher and journal entries, these are new concepts, basically. So what we are recommending here is making sure that your accounting books contains all the journal entries. Usually we have our, we have seen in, in the common practice that you make the entries, but at the end of the day, maybe you, you don't print them, you don't prepare like Excel accounting books are not printed. And I think this is one of uh, the things that are referring here. It's important to include the journal entries on the voucher as part of your accounting books. Also, some other things that will comprehend uh, your, your accounting books will be the tax ID registration, some notices requested, and these back of documentation. And here it's, it's important to mention that the way this regulation is written doesn't clarify if these notices can be considered valid if they were sent by electronic media, or they have to be printed and stamped by the tax authorities. However, uh, we believe that this shouldn't be a problem since most of the filings nowadays are being done electronically. So this is only like support documentation that we'll have uh, on this matter. So we don't think there shouldn't be a problem for electronic support documentation related to notices to the government. C correct. And, and uh, as Leo mentions, everything is electronic these days, but, but we have seen cases where if you were registered in 1988, that you would have to have the actual paper stamped and, and available. And, and that is a new change, to have that at your tax domicile. So we will be contacting clients to create and deliver a file for you to have on site for all these types of notices that are new obligations with us only keeping a copy. Right, because every, like I mentioned before, it's very, very important to keep in mind, to have in mind that all these accounting groups the tax code establishes that needs to be in your tax address. Uh, so I think this is a, the, the reason why Bernie is pointing this out. Okay, this slide that we're watching here related to some other uh, paperwork that will become part of your accounting. It's basically annual returns, informative, some monthly by monthly, quarterly, or definitive tax installments. Uh, all the taxes, basically, uh, no matter your frequent, will become part of your accounting as well. And this is what we were mentioning earlier regarding the bank statement. Here, the rules gives more clarification to what will be considered bank statement. And they say that there will be the bank account statement and even the reconciliation. And this is interesting and this is something new that was added here. Uh, because in the past, uh, the, if they ask you for your, if the tax authority uh, is part of their uh, reviewing on you, you were obligated to give them your accounting at the same time. So if they, if this uh, requirement was not posted in here, you were not allowed or you were not obligated to give them more, the, the tax, uh, your bank account statement. So in this case, I think this is the reason why the tax authorities give this additional uh, information and includes as part of your accounting. As well as a statement of investments, some credit services cards that are like prepaid, as well as food coupons and gasoline. So it's corporate cards, uh, the corporate credit cards, the, the food coupon statement of account, uh, and, and a lot of the times you, you pay the, the, the invoice of the food coupon uh, company and you, you disperse the money to the, to the employees, but really no one has the culture of keeping those statement of accounts uh, in, in a very uh, like specific manner, and, and nowadays we, we would recommend that you do so. Yeah, and, and it's interesting also that the government is requesting for bank account statements and reconciliation. We have heard some gossips around the street that 
said that maybe later on the tax authorities will ask also the bank institutions to provide as well the bank account statements of the taxpayers so they could make like double process uh, from both sides in order to discard uh, some discrepancies and make sure that all the deposit that's being considered as payments in your accounting books. Uh, who knows, but uh, it is possible. It's Mexico, right? We have, we have seen things. Amazing. Uh, the following slide basically shows also some other things that will be considered part of your accounting. And these are the shares, capital stock, and negotiable instrument in which the taxpayer is involved. It would be interesting uh, to see if the company, the Mexican entity, are has uh, investments in some other companies, they are obligated to have their proper shares or the, the capital stock. So it will also be. And, and just, just to complement that, Leo, uh, uh, for example, an SA type of company, which is the Inc. of, of Mexico, does have shares, and, and so we would recommend seeing that with your lawyers of, of uh, uh, making sure that you have those shares uh, issued, and, and there, there the, the issue is it should be in the domicile, theoretically, of the shareholder, not so much of the, the company that we're talking about. So if, if the shareholder is a, a U.S. entity or a French entity, uh, it, it gets a little confusing as to where, where the shares should be because they shouldn't be necessarily at the tax address of the company that we're talking about, but rather of the shareholder. The SDRL type of companies do not issue shares, so, so those wouldn't be a problem. But th this becomes more of an issue if you have a Mexican company that holds shares for another company. Right, sure. Some other thing that we would consider also part of the accounting would be the documents related to personnel hired to provide subordinated personal services as well as registrations or notification regarding social security and contributions. This is something that is new also. This was not uh, in, the past, in the past regulations. Uh, but it will be interesting here to understand what we need to understand by document related to. Uh, the, there, it's hard to say basically uh, what comprehends here. We believe it's everything that it is related, related to your internal processes of hiring employees. Uh, what, what would be this? Uh, maybe like the contracts of your employees, uh, their resumes when they first came and after they are and asked for the job, uh, the bonus plans, and, well, it's hard to say there's nothing else written, but we believe that it's best to have as much information as possible related to the personnel that you hire. So basically we are suggesting here to make sure that all the files of the current personnel, at least the current personnel, it's up to date on this matter. And it's interesting here to know is that even when the tax uh, regulation here establishes that you have to have um, the social security registration and notification, the tax authority by itself are not permitted to start a review in social security matters. But it, it would be like right away if they notice something strange that they will go to the social security authorities and ask them for them to review it directly to you. So in, in a matter of ways, it, it is linked here. So it would be important to have all the security uh, social security stuff all, also up to date. Right. And we'll be coordinating with clients and friends to concentrate all the information for employees so that you can have it available uh, at your tax address upon request. Uh, one of the things will be to create that individual file per person and, and always have it available. Uh, that, that, that would probably be the best practice that, that we would recommend. Right. Uh, the last requirements of this uh, letter A of this first section of Article 33rd establishes that also comprehends your accounting, the customs related to import and export documents. And it will be interesting here also to, to understand what can be considered import and export documents. 
uh, well, we believe it would be the same. As much information as you can have uh, related to uh, foreign trade operations, we recommend to make sure that your files related to import and export transactions are up to date. Uh, what are we meaning here? Well, the other things, not only like the pendimento here, the import and export document, but also the commercial invoice, also the uh, origin certificate, which uh, uh, and some other information related to the export operation. And, and here, the, the what happens to a lot of companies is, for example, if your custom broker doesn't turn over the information on time, you, you can have issues uh, not being able to locate certain uh, import documents or pedimentos, and there an option is to to file the what's known as the Glossa report, which is basically a, a big spreadsheet that details all of your international commerce transactions, and so that you can check against what you have versus what the government system has, and, that, and that's a good practice, uh, probably for any company that that imports. Uh, especially for people that import uh, temporarily with EMIX programs, uh, to, to have that. So if anyone needs help getting that, we, we would be uh, happy to help. Right. Some other thing that will be put to your accounting will be the documentation and information of all the transactions, act or activities entries. And this is basically all the invoices that supports uh, your transactions. And it's important to notice here that this invoice is not only the reprinted form, but the tax uh, laws establish itself that you also have to have the electronic file. Uh, this is, yeah. let, let me just stress what, what Leo is mentioning. Uh, you can have the PDF or printed out version of an invoice, but the government is more and more focusing on what really makes a deduction deductible is that XML file. So, so having that XML file traceable, and, and, and we'll see what, what, how that needs to be traced, is going to be more and more and more important. Right. And what else? It's all other mandatory return based on tax dispositions. Basically, these are quarterly, annual other reports handled through the Ministry of Economy, uh, Matilda Dora, annual informity, state tax, and some other. Uh, additional information. Okay, so far we have mentioned what will be considered accounting according to the Mexican tax law, which is established in letter A of Article 33 of three of these new rules from the Federal Tax Code. Now, what we will see in the following slide are the requirements that the journal entries will have to meet according to letter or section B of this same article 33. So now we, we have to have in mind that this article 33 basically establishes the rules for the accounting. Letter A establishes the document that will be needed and will comprehend accounting. And letter B will see the requirement that the journal entries will have to meet. Correct. And, and the important thing in all of this for the, the regulation that there is no transition period. So uh, we need to, uh, and, and even though, as you'll see them, they're very extreme and, and we think the authorities will soften them, we, we do have to comply as much as possible and, and get to the point where, where we are complying 100%. Okay, uh, here are some of the requirements that journal entries need to comply. The first one is related to analytical registration, basically meaning that they, they need to be detailed. Uh, this, this point is tricky as well as the following one, uh, because they said that they are uh, becoming mandatory that during the month of the transactions, they are post posted. Uh, the, the transaction that took place in one month, they need to be posted in that same month. And also, you will have five days during, uh, after the transaction took place for you to register. <coughs> basically, 
basically what we see here in items number two and three, what we mentioned here from the timing period, it's very difficult to miss since a lot of companies process tons and tons of information and sometimes it's not possible to register everything during the month or even during the five following days. So uh, sometimes you don't have all the information available and this could become like a serious problem. And th these, uh, like especially the first one posted during the month is just crazy. Like I think even very large companies, banks, have said that they can't comply with this, uh, and, and they're very, uh, they're very systems based, and everything's automated. But even um, if you have travel expenses for an employee that left the 30th of the month, spent, uh, spent, like had expenses for that day, and delivered his expense report the following Monday, you would not be in compliance. So, so I think there's there's kind of a, a, a mistaken avenue that the government is taking. Uh, it used to be two months, Leo, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, and, and having your accounting not up to date for two months is, is really excessive. But uh, where, where this rule should end up is, okay, have your accounting done before you have to file your informative returns and your tax installments, and the accounting online that we're talking about, which would be the 17th of the following month. That's that's reasonable. The, the government, uh, with this rule, is, is is really asking too much of people. And through chambers of commerce, through, through the American Chamber of Commerce, through other uh, business organizations, uh, th there's been a lot of pushback and, and trying to get these rules uh, like these two, which are, are very severe, uh, they really don't uh, add value to, to the tax authority's ability to uh, get money, which is the, at the end of their objective. Uh, so again, a, a bit crazy. Now, we, we will be glad to discuss with you to see how to comply in as much as possible. And even though they will soften things, uh, you, you, we can't recommend you to count on it. And so we would focus our energy on complying as it currently stands. Uh, but but the days are gone now that when, when you could have a month a, a company a month or two behind. Right. <coughs> now uh, and, and maybe I was. Uh, can we go back? On? Yeah, the, the other requirement is basically that you register all your operations in a chronologically manner. Uh, th this is uh, in a daily ledger. You, it may need to be uh, done like this. And also to include the account name uh, with the initial balance, basically to have like your general ledger. Yeah. And here there, there are two books <coughs> that, uh, that you need to have printed out or the general practice for these two legal books that you would you would have and it's how the authorities would want to see it but there is no regulation that you have to have them printed out and, and find it uh, and bound uh, but it's to have the daily ledger and the general ledger and uh, a lot of times the daily ledger would have operations for every day debit, credit, debit, credit per day, like what happened, like what individual entries happened for every day, and you print that out. Now, if you're very ecologically friendly and you don't want to print out 5,000 pages, well, you could print the report in PDF and have it stored available uh, without being able to modify so that uh, you could have it available for the authorities at any time. The other one is the general ledger, which would detail per account the same thing, like what happened, what debits, credits per account for, for each uh, period. So if you, if you don't know if your system can do this or have any questions, uh, just let us know. Something else that we need to consider is that uh, the journal entries need to be identified uh, by linking the folios assigned to the tax receipts. 
uh, of the support documentation. Uh, basically, these requirements establish that the journal entries that you post in your accounting will need to contain the digital folio of the invoice related to the transaction that, that took place. And you need to also identify the payment method, the contributions, uh, the taxes, uh, and everything. Uh, once again, we, we believe that this is too much work to be done. Yeah. And here, what are we seeing? Uh, common types of softwares in Mexico, the, the equivalent of a QuickBooks, uh, would be Compact. And uh, Compact and other uh, systems in Mexico are looking at creating a data administrator module where you would upload all of your XML files for all of your expenses and assign them to the individual entries. And therefore, through the system, you would have traceability as to which expenses you have that don't have a, an XML file, and, and you could follow up on getting it. So very big companies already handle uh, addendas where uh, through their purchasing system, it gets routed automatically. So you send, you send your electronic invoice and it gets automatically routed through their system, through their AP system, and it automatically uh, gets dumped into the correct place. Uh, Mid-size and small companies do not have that. Not everyone is Coca-Cola. So to see how to address this issue, which is huge, like the amount of keying that would have to happen uh, it is just uh, mind-boggling. It would double or triple the time that it takes to do accounting if you have to add in all these different uh, uh, additional uh, items for every entry, be it a 10 peso entry, you would have to uh, add all these items. So the, the only real practical way to go is to automate it. And so to see how to do that, uh, please let us know and, and we can prepare an analysis of, of your system and, and how, to, how to work it. Yes, and, and the other thing here related to what needs to be considered in your accounting books is uh, to identify investments, including the backup documentation or tax receipt here. And it will be important or we believe that it's important that this could be detailed also in, in another spreadsheet that you will have like a, a special control of your assets. What, what we're, and ju just, uh, sorry, sorry Leo, uh, by investments we mean fixed asset investments. Right. Yes, correct, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, something that we are recommending here is basically just to make sure that the file of your fixed asset investment is up to date. Uh, what do we mean by these files? Well, all the invoices, uh, the import documents, and everything that relates uh, to the purchase of that good. That's it. Okay, also the Federal Tax Code regulation establishes that you have to prepare statements, basically the four financial statements. Uh, and these will also include memorandum, the accounts, memorandum accounts and the notes for these statements as well. Yeah. And new to this is the shareholder equity statement and cash flow, uh, which are part of the four typical uh, financials that you would get through an audit report. Uh, but those last two weren't included as legally uh, required statements. Uh, and, and here the, the question is, will these be needed monthly or yearly? And we tend to think that as the accounting online uh, comes into place, we'll see that they'll need to be needed monthly. Yes, correct. Uh, the other item or the other bullet that we have in here is regarding to merchandise. And it will be important that you have a very uh, well inventory control and it's up to date. So it could be clearly identified what is raw material, what is work in progress, finished goods, and even what goods are destined to be donated or destroyed. If, if this is something that uh, you have so far, that, that is great, but if not, please, uh, once again, contact us and we'll be glad to assist you in this matter, so we make sure that you comply with this regulation. Yeah. The, the important thing uh, to note on, on your inventory 
for it to be of any use is that it does have to tie to the books and it has to be complete and clear as to the method of costing used, such as first in, first out, etc. Right. This tool is basically explaining that it will be important to identify contributions that are to be cancelled or refunded. Basically, what we are recommending here is to have uh, your accounting book detailed by the accounts for each type of contribution, uh, meaning VAT return, VAT creditable, and even uh, separated or split by tax rate, 16%, 0 percent rate, uh, exempt and the proof the requirements are being met for tax incentive as subsidies rent. Okay, well, this is one of the most important changes. Uh, basically, what we are seeing here is the language. Uh, and everything must be in Spanish. And features must be in pesos. Uh, so the, the bullet reads that when the information, including the accountant, it's in a language other than Spanish, or the values are in a different foreign currency, the corresponding translation will have to be provided, as well as the exchange rate used. Uh, basically, this requirement establishes that all the support documentation of your transaction needs to be in Spanish and turn into pesos. And if it's a different language, you will have to provide a corresponding translation. And this is a very, very significant change because still in last year, the Mexican tax law establishes this requirement, but only when the tax authority requests it, and not for every transaction, no matter if they request it or not. So we find this change a strong burden for the taxpayer who constantly celebrates operation with foreign entities in languages different than Spanish because of the administrative work that had to be done in here. Uh, but, well, Berlin and I, we, we were discussing and we believe it will be easier to ask the tax authorities to take English classes <laughs> than making us translate every English, right? Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's great, Leo. And uh, this is a major change, like having everything be in Spanish as we'll see, uh, th there are different aspects to this. Uh, like having everything be in Spanish. Uh, now, it's important to note that like, they're not saying it has to be a certified translation, so so we don't think it has to be a certified translation. But uh, even if it's a taxi invoice for ten dollars when a person was on a trip to the U.S., we would have to translate the to and from. So it, it becomes ridiculous, and, and there is no de minimis uh, like cutoff level. Uh, so uh, one important thing, like we would have to analyze each individual client's case. Uh, of course, the best option is to have, for example, your chart of accounts in Spanish. Uh, to have automated entries also be in Spanish or bilingual, and because. The rule is it has to be in Spanish. It doesn't say it has to be in Spanish only. So if we had an entry that said cost and it also said slash costo with an O at the end, then, then we think you would be compliant. Now, invoices in Spanish, uh, we, we would definitely be waiting for rules to see uh, what will come out of this. We would recommend translating like preemptively, because what, what Leo mentions that before the government could request translation, and, and that was an easy role, and, and everyone was fine with that, and, and the authorities, like, uh, like we, we never really had any questions, like if there was an audit, here I have my contract in English, they would request, okay, well, give me a certified translation, and you would do that, and there would be no issue, and there's not a huge expense related to that. But translating every invoice and translating every entry to make sure that all of your entries are to be considered duly registered in your accounting are in Spanish, that, that is a burden. And, and that's, that's what the Chambers of Commerce are working with the government to address. 
Now, one thing that's important is inventory in U.S. dollars because we, we talked about Spanish, but we also need it in pesos. So uh, clients can be in the case where, well, my system tracks my inventory in dollars and then I do a conversion at the end of the month. That, that would no longer be permitted. Like we, we would need to address each case uh, differently and, and see what can be done. Uh, but you would also not be complying with registering operations within five days if you only did costing once a month. Right. And the other bullet of the other change that we have seen here is the cost center. And it establishes that you need to make your registration best based on cost centers. Basically the branch uh, by branch this is what yeah. this is meaning. Something here that we have in the slide related to bank account, it is the same that we have mentioned so far. It will be important to identify uh, the deposits and withdrawal made for to the bank accounts. So in order to meet with this requirement, it will be very important to have all the bank accounts payment in the tax domicile of the company so you could make this deposit integration. As well as related to VAT, it will be important to register so it could be clearly identified which operations were subject to VAT 16%, 0% rate, except exempt, or transactions not affected by VAT. Correctly. Okay. Uh, this is insights or sub-insights unlucky number 13. This is the federal tax code regulations uh, and this is Article 33, Section 13, and it's unlucky and boy. Uh, Leo, can you describe all the things that would need to be included in an accounting register in order to be considered valid? Sure. Uh, here we find we, we have the seven items that will need to be considered in the registration in each journal entry that you pose for the transactions. Uh, it needs to contain the date in which the transaction was conducted, the description and concept, the quantity or measurement unit method of payment specifying whether it was cash, credit, or installment, the means of payment or cancellation of the obligation, the amount of the transaction, the specified if payment in cash, white transfer check, or any other payment method, and when payment is made, is made in kind of to an exchange or, or an offset, the type of good or service granted as compensation and its value must be indicated. So basically what we are watching here is that your journal entry will need to contain all the information that already contains the electronic invoice. So uh, all this information will be used to cross journal entries with electronic invoice in order to link everything automatically. Uh, maybe can, can we see an example that we have in the following slide? <clears throat> this would be like uh, the journal entry would need to look like in order to meet all the requirements. Uh, if you see, they're uh, marked by item, each one by one, but uh, at the end of the day, it's a lot of information that needs to be typed. So this is the reason why Bernie and I were mentioned that becomes a burden to the taxpayers because it's a lot of time that it's involving here and does not represent any uh, uh, of the objective of the government, which is uh, the, to collect the money from the taxpayers. Correct. And what will be important here will be how you can attach the XML file, as was mentioned, to the corresponding journal entry and have things be uploaded automatically, like fall into the right fields, so that you don't have to manually key all this stuff. So uh, th that that's where where I, I think everything is going. Right. The following is not, the slide is related to inventories. Basically, it it that details you the way your inventory control needs to be needs to be uh, what needs to be met in, in order to to fulfill with this requirement. Basically, it shows that. Uh, it needs to be detailed by unit, type of merchandise, uh, 
product in process, date of acquisition, sales start, beginning, uh, initial, final balance, and also it's important to consider the valuation method that you're using here. Correctly. So basically what I recommend you here just to make sure that you're complying with it and in case you're not, make sure uh, you make the necessary changes and uh, get, get in touch with us. We'll be glad to do this for uh, also. Basically here we're mentioning uh, what, what we have, this is like a summary of what we have been mentioning so far. Make registration in electronic ways. Uh, accounting, again, very, very important, needs to be in the tax dumb account of the company. It is very, very important. And back, backup documentation for all these entries, uh, and, and it can be substantial volume of information, uh, which will have to be at the taxpayer's uh, tax address. And we'll, we'll be contacting clients in order to organize, concentrate, and deliver all information in as much as possible. Now, we'll, we'll see when we talk about fines, but uh, potential fines for a lot of these are not significant. Uh, and, and we'll have to weigh cost benefit uh, for different areas. Uh, for example, if you have all your information off-site at, at a type of Iron Mountain, well, that has advantages uh, on, on the storage side and, and on the security side for you. And, and, and so there would have to be an analysis of, of the cost and, and upsides and downsides. Some other thing that we need to have in mind uh, related to keep and store accounting is that all the documentation regarding the design of electronic system used to store and process the accounting information and items need to be uh, kept. Also the equipment and operations will have to be available for the tax authority in case of requirement so they can uh, start their, their proper review. And we need to comply with the Mexican norm uh, regarding and conserving electronic documents. Well, this gives complementary information uh, just to have in mind regarding accounting, accounting terms. Basically explains that you have to save and keep your accounting information in optical disk and electronic media. Yeah, or any other backup. Uh, mechanism that you have. Right. Now we got, we, we got to uh, to the impressions here. Uh, this, this is uh, like a summary of the, the impressions that can be considered if we are not complying with the requirements that we have mentioned so far. Basically, failure to keep accounting records goes from a fine to a thousand two hundred up to 11, almost 12,000 pesos. These amounts are in pesos, yeah. yeah so no, no one have a heart attack. <laughs> right. Now, uh, fines, when, when, you, when you are reviewed, uh, I don't see fines necessarily as a bad thing. As in, and as in any work when audited, the auditor won't go away empty-handed. So if they're allowed to impose a couple of fines, that, that can sometimes help close an audit which can help things not drive on and, and, and not uh, have them uh, try to question more substantial items. Right. Number two and number three basically are referring. The first one is not not maintaining or not uh, keep your accounting books according to the laws, the, the way they are mentioned. For example, the inventory evaluation or the failure to comply with it uh, or to carry out inadequate control processes, this is uh, important. And also, number three establishes that, again, what we have mentioned so far, uh, the accounting needs to be in the tax address. Because if you do, do not, you get yourself required to get a penalty of 260 up to almost 6,000 pesos. And, and the, di the different fines, like, well, obviously when you see these fines, you kind of tie up give us higher relief, uh, but, but we would need to analyze in each individual company and, and how you're complying and where you're deficient if you are, and analyze any other contingencies that might be around. Okay, so far we have uh, mentioned basically the most important changes related to accounting, accounting for, for yourself, for your, your own books. 
Now what we're going to discuss a little bit is what we have so far related to online accounting. And the overall strategy of the government, as you'll see it, is to have everything be online. We have the tax mailbox, which we'll talk about at the end. We have the electronic accounting, which is coming into play uh, very soon. We have the digital tax receipts, which are the, CF, the famous CFDIs or, or the electronic invoices. And we have an aspect that we won't talk about now, but it's an electronic review, which is basically the government taking all the other three running it through a mixer and, and coming up with where you're wrong, basically. Yeah, basically what, what Bernie very was mentioning that uh, or what we believe is the government wants to have all the information available at all times. So they could review at any time uh, because they would already have that information. We are coming to an era where the tax authorities are starting to uh, get use of the electronic media to get from self from some information. Yeah, and co what I severely doubt we will see is them uh, being more efficient, but I don't see them <laughs> reducing the number of employees that work at the at the SAT, <laughs> like like any government administration. Right. One back. One back. There we go. Yeah, but and basically what we have regarding electronic accounting, accounting, it's also established in Article 28 of the Federal Tax Code. Again, we go to this, this article. However, we are watching now Section 4, which establishes that the taxpayer will register their accounting information on a monthly basis throughout the tax authority's website per the general regu regulations. Uh, however, as of today's, uh, so today, there are no rules for this yet, so we'll, we'll have to wait on this matter. Uh, this is basically some uh, gossip that we have heard. Uh, it's not there is not a specific thing, uh, but the accounting system will have to be able to operate XML files with account, the trial balance and entry information, and digital tax still receipts will be based for for the review, but like, but like what, we're, what I would mention, uh, there are not rules published yet, so we'll have to wait. And, and the important thing is, the government has said the deadline to fulfill this obligation is as of July 1st, 2013, which is just around the corner. Uh, it can and will likely be deferred for a couple of months, or maybe even scaled by type of taxpayer, uh, but you need to be ready for this as your accounting uh, will basically be online monthly for the authorities. So we, we do recommend an individual analysis of each company's accounting to see if it is in compliance with the new regulations that we just talked about and that you're ready for any online accounting. Well, basically this slide shows only the, the aim or the goal of the tax authorities on these matters. They want to make automatically automatic uh, reviewing on related to tax reforms, offsets, uh, or make uh, auditory tests over the strange hardware operation. I think this is the main idea of the government. That's correct. Okay, uh, the, the details and mechanisms through which the information will have to be filed, it's still unknown, that like, like we had mentioned and the higher administrative costs are expected in order to comply with this obligation, for sure. So far, uh, well, th this is everything related to electronic, <coughs> to accounting, electronic accounting, I'm sorry. Uh, now we're going to, and Leo, if, you, if you'll allow me, once we do get the rules, we'll be having a follow-up webcast just regarding accounting online, so uh, look, look out for that. Right. The other thing that uh, that that we have also as uh, news is related to tax mailbox. What what is this tax mailbox? Well, this is basically like an electronic communication system located in tax authorities' website between the tax authorities and the taxpayers, and this this will be used for electronic notifications 
and make some uh, community communications with the taxpayers as well. And, and think of it as a portal between the government and, and yourself, but with, with chance to security and communications, uh, and, and the government is, is very interested in this because it, it allows them to streamline their uh, notification procedures and for the uh, taxpayers not be able to claim they didn't receive something. Right. Uh, actually, it's a really uh, well, it's a, a doable process here. What what you need to do to obtain access to these tax mailboxes is basically uh, the tax ID uh, to get through the web application, your electronic signatures of the company, some email addresses, and a mobile phone number. Uh, I have this is basically this slide shows like shows some frequent, frequent asked questions like how do I know I have any notifications issued, issued by the authorities or at what point will the electronic notification be considered given. So this gives additional information here. When does uh, the mailbox, the tax mailbox, goes into effect? Well, for legal entities, it, it is in June 30. 2014, and for individual taxpayers, it becomes mandatory in January 1st, 2015. This is, and, and following are just a few notices or a few uh, items that can be noticed that you, you will be notified, I'm sorry, through the tax mailbox. Tax credit resolutions, obligation control requirements, refund or offset resolutions, and some other, some other information and here. And Hopefully with, with, and I think that's the strategy of the government, uh, it seems they have a lot of IT people on staff, uh, but, but the idea is to have all of this very much automated, everything's in, online, and as part of that, uh, companies that ask for a refund, you have your accounting online, all the government has all the XMLs, uh, they notify you uh, requests of information online, and so it should, once it gets automated, once it gets in place, once they know what they're doing with it, uh, it should help to bring down, for example, refund times. Like that, that's the whole goal, um, or, or that would be the, the cherry on, on top of the cake for, for the taxpayers is, well, if I'm complying with everything, it should get to the point where uh, tax administration uh, and, and for companies that are compliant, becomes easier uh, with regards to refunds, for example. Something that you will need also to consider as part of the tax mailbox, it will be that the, you will have three days to consult a notification. Once you receive the email, that, that you receive one notification in your tax mailbox. So if you don't consult it or you don't review it during the following three days, at day four, it will be considered effectively. And so we are recommending here uh, to include several email addresses on the tax mailbox registration. Uh, so you make sure that in case one of the account doesn't work or reject the email, at least some of the other email accounts they could receive it. Otherwise, you will still, uh, that this notification will be considered effectively. And it's important to mention or to have in mind that these notifications sometimes uh, have uh, allowed you a specific time frame to answer. And if you don't comply, you can make yourself subject to get a penalty. And, and if you don't structure it properly, the accountant would never be able to go on vacation. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think that's the point. Uh, what Leo is mentioning is important here, having an email address. Like you can only register, I believe, one email address with the government. Uh, but, but the idea would be to have uh, the company create an email that gets internally replicated to many, many different people. So if you have a person leave, you can substitute it internally and not have to go to the government uh, to substitute an email. And it can be a team of people like internally with a company having us copied so that if there are any notifications, no matter when that happens, that there's always someone that's going to be able to look at that uh, 
uh, email and, and be able to follow up on it. Now, we, we will be contacting clients uh, between now and, and June in order to set up this tax mailbox if you haven't already been contacted, so, so we will be contacting you. Yeah, and final considerations uh, and before we open things up uh, to Q&A, uh, right on time, uh, is the tax authorities aim with all these modifications to modernize and, and take advantage as much as possible the use of internet and technology. And according to them, these simplifications are granted so that all interactions happen in real time and electronically. Uh, we really don't feel that any of this could be called simplification. Like any time where you have to spend this much time analyzing what accounting means and, and what is included in accounting, we really don't think it's simplification. We, we believe the government should have focused on taxpayers that aren't paying through other means rather than, than all of what they're doing, but they didn't really ask us for a vote, so uh, here we are. And we'll, we'll open up uh, the session for questions and answers now. Okay. Uh, here I have one deal for you. Uh, in the case a uh, company uh, has several faults that, that are subject to a fine, uh, such as not having their accounting up to date, not having it in Spanish, what fine would apply according to the SAT? Right, Bernie. Well, on this scenario, I'm based on Article 75 of the Federal Tax Code. Uh, it establishes that when a, whenever a taxpayer is subject to several penalties, you only will be charged for one, the highest penalty. So in this scenario, we would need to look the higher penalty, and that will be the only one that you will need to pay. You wouldn't need to pay one for each infraction, but one that, that represents the highest. Okay. Uh, we have another one, which is, is there a definition of what is meant by accounting entries must be analytical? Uh, and by analytical, we mean detail, so it's not a summarized transaction where I have sales for the day were, uh, I don't know, $10,000 and that was made up between 100 different transactions. That, that would have to mean uh, each individual transaction would have to be detailed. So, so your system shouldn't summarize operations that were individual, is, is what they mean by analytical. Now, the next question we have uh, is there any transition period for companies that, to comply with these requirements? Right. Here, really, well, the, the answer is no. Uh, the, it's unfortunately, but the government is not allowing any transition period like we saw on the, on the first slide. Uh, the rules were published in April 2nd and becomes mandatory on April 3rd. So th there is no transition period. And this is something, all that we have mentioned is something that companies must be complying nowadays. Okay. Uh, what is meant by the XML requirements? And, and by XML requirements, well, when we talk about the XML, we're talking about the electronic invoice. Uh, and, and we do have a webcast on our website that talks all about electronic invoicing, if you want to take a look at that or contact us. But any electronic invoice has, it is, the essence of the electronic invoice is the file that is ended in .xml. So if you see our JWO invoice, for example, you'll get a PDF and you'll get an XML file. So what we're talking about the XML file is that, the actual file. The, the, the next question we have, will accrual journal entries no longer be allowed? Any accrual, and, and this is where it gets kind of crazy, the, the viewpoint of the authorities, and where the accounting online, we'll, we'll have to see how the regulations, how they ask for things, but financial accounting is still, uh, you're still obligated to do financial accounting per Mexican gap. So if you have an accrual, it needs to be done, and it needs to be done in your statutory books. Uh, there would be no XML tied to that accrual. 
but but the government uh, like we'll see how they categorize things when when we go over uh, the accounting online. So so in in essence, you will need to continue doing all your accruals and, and financial accounting. Now uh, another question: uh, invoices that are in another language would have to be accompanied with a trans like an authorized. Uh, translation, Leo, do you want to get that one? Yeah, sure, Bernie. Uh, well, the way that this decision is written, it only mentions that attached to the support documentation, you need to uh, accom accompany with a translation. It doesn't say that it has to be like a, a certified translation, so we think that it should be more than enough to have like a regular trans translation, not by a certified uh, person. Okay, so not, not a certified translator. Right. Okay. Uh, if I have a branch that's registered for, for the tax authorities and I only pay rent, light, and telephone, would I still have to realize a, a separate, uh, like a cost center for that branch? Right. Uh, thank, thank you, Bernie. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. What, what we were mentioning before, is that uh, the regulations, the new regulations, establishes that you have to have identify in, in a cost basis by branches. No matter how big or small it is the branch, you need to have a detail in your accounting. That, that's correct. And, and the uh, this is new. Like before, you didn't have to. Like your accounting could be just one rolled up. Like imagine a Walmart that has branches everywhere. They could have just one accounting rolled up in, in, in to like all all the branches uh, summed up together. Of course, a Walmart will have uh, what uh, what profitability a different branch has, and, and many companies will have that. But if you don't, that is something uh, that that would need to happen. Uh, the next question we have would be. Uh, what type of information will be sent um, in order to comply with accounting online? Uh, Leo, do you want to get that? Yes, yes, I mean, uh, Well, unfortunately, like we already mentioned before, there are there are and still specific rules of the information that will have to be provided on a monthly basis. What we know so far is only that it will be on a monthly basis, and it's mandatory for July. Like we were mentioned, but just like Bernie was mentioned, there are no specific rules yet, so we, maybe it takes longer to become mandatory for this. Sure. Uh, when is the due date to change to the Spanish language entries, the GL accounts, etc.? Leo, do you want to get that one? Yeah. Well, the, the due date for that would be uh, April 3rd. Yeah. So, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and here you have to comply uh, in as much as possible. Like Spanish, I think, if we separate one of like two of the big changes, which are, are accounting in Spanish uh, and pesos, and complying within the five days, like I think, complying within the five days, I, I don't see the government cracking down too hard on the person if they don't comply within the five days. But if your accounting is in Spanish and, and or not in Spanish and not in pesos parts of it, then I, I think there would be traceability of that for them to impose fines and other consequences. So I, I think that the recommendation would be to to adjust that. Okay. Um, let me see what else we have here. If I register sales on a weekly basis in one registry, would I be not complying with the new requirements? Uh, Leo, do you want to get that? Yes, Bernie. Uh, well, the answer would be would be yes. That the thing here, or what we mentioned before, is that the, the, since the registration needs to be detailed, it's important that you have them like uh, detailed and chronologically way. So it would be important that you, you make it in this way and not only one registration for the operation that took place uh, in a whole week period. Uh, if we continue on, uh, 
Uh, tax mailbox notifications effective on the fourth day. Is this the fourth business day or calendar? Uh, I, I think that would be business day. Correct. Okay, hold on. Uh, what is considered an authorized translation? I think we already address, addressed that. It's any translation. There isn't a uh, need for it to be a certified translation. Um, uh, can we pay invoices that come in from foreign countries in their currency, or do we have to pay all in pesos? If in pesos, we have to get contracts changed. You can continue to pay. Like if I want to pay in Moroccan dirham, I can still do that. If I want to pay in euros, I want to pay in yen. If I'm invoiced, like what we're talking about here now is not really the the exchange or the, the currency that's used, but in order for the accounting to be proper for the Mexican tax authorities is for you have to put the exchange rate. So if I if I paid uh, a million yen for something, like Somewhere in my accounting registry, I have to be able to track the exchange rate that was used. So it has to be uh, specifically mentioned. And if I'm doing that, I'm fine. If the invoice is in Japanese, I would need a translation to accompany also that, uh, that invoice. With, so I would have two things. I would have the exchange rate that's used, and I would also have uh, the translation of the document if it was in another language other than Spanish. Uh, April 3rd, 2014, for all these regulations, that's correct. It's April 3rd, 2014. Uh, a lot of this has been uh, digesting all of these regulations has been very complicated. Like the authorities, we still uh, feel that there are regulations that will be issued by, by the authorities that will be complementary to the accounting online uh, regulations that still have to be issued. Uh, for example, Compact, which is a very uh, common system in Mexico, will not issue their new version of Compact, which will comply with the current regulations, until they have the new rules for accounting online, which are due very soon as well, so that uh, they don't have to issue two versions of the software. So uh, will, will that lead to you have to going back and verifying and updating any accounting for prior months. Uh, yes, it will include a lot of reprocess, and, and that would be the recommendation. Um, the next question is, if all documents are to be in Spanish, how will invoices from suppliers in the U.S., which are in English, to be treated? Will they have to be translated into Spanish? The answer is yes. What we're looking for from the government, and, and maybe the best practice would be if I have a $50 invoice for a taxi, maybe I don't translate that one. But if I have a $200,000 invoice from uh, especially my inner company, uh, that I do translate that one. And, or, or you could get to, well, if they're charging me royalties, I can put in the text of the, the invoice bilingual from the onta, So I don't really have to translate it. It's bilingual. And, and you do it once, and then you have the, the U.S. entity or, or the foreign entity invoice you in that fashion always. So, so yes, and, and I understand the burden is tremendous, uh, and, and we would have to see uh, what, what the strategy would be in order to uh, do those translations. So it, it, it seems to be the translator full employment law. <laughs> so. Uh, think if you're a translator, you're going to be doing okay. Uh, what, what type of information would we be sending to the SAT through the, the uh, tax mailbox? No, we, we already answered that question. Uh, we were mentioning that unfortunately there are not specific rules yet that uh, establish a way information will need to be complied. What we were mentioning here is only that what we know so far is that it will be on a monthly basis and it becomes mandatory on July 1st. However, since no rules have been published yet, we'll have to wait. Yeah, for, for the online accounting. For, for the tax mailbox, uh, any refunds, requests, government information, that, that, that's what they would be asking for. 
Uh, we, we have run out of time here. Uh, we could talk about this subject for hours and hours and, and not finish. And, and that, that's how uh, new all this is. Uh, but we do thank you for participating in our webcast. We hope it has been informative. Uh, if there are any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us and join us for other webcasts. Uh, we, we appreciate uh, your attendance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.